Hi guys. Today is the first episode of our Spark Tuning series. We will be talking about how to debug and how to tune performance of Spark jobs. My name is Martin. I'm CEO of Tantus Data, a company helping clients with building data and ML applications. And let's start with a very simple example of a case when something goes wrong with Spark and we will learn how to debug it and how to fix it. It will be a very simple query, very simple, but still realistic because it will be based on real production use cases I often encounter in production pipelines. And you will be able to apply techniques presented here in the pipelines you are working on. Let's have a look at the code first. What we do, we are reading from events table, and this table contains information about mobile application, what is happening with it, whether user clicked a button, whether user scrolled down, and so on. And it is very common to collect this kind of data. And in our simplistic example, we have just event ID, user ID, and event timestamp because what we would like to calculate is the time difference between events of the same user, so we understand how fast they make a decision. And we understand that, we understand where the gaps are, so we could potentially identify the improvements in the mobile application because we know where the user spends the most time on. So what we do as the first step, we use the lead function in order to generate an extra column, which tells us the timestamp of the next event. So potentially we can calculate the time difference, the distribution of it per user, and so on. And the SQL code is perfectly fine. So it will just run on Spark, right? Let's see. So let's have a look at this Spark UI. First of all, we have this single job, which is running for almost an hour. So let's have a look at that. And we can see a stage which, which is responsible for all that time. So let's look there. And in that stage, we can have a look at the event timeline. And we can see that most of the tasks are finishing in no time, but there is this one which is taking much more time and it's failing. And the task which is taking much more time than the other ones is a hint of inefficiency of unequal data distribution. If we scroll down, we can see that we have some more failures of probably the same task, but let's confirm that, let's scroll down. So yeah, we have a bunch of failures, but each of the failure is another attempt of the same task. So we have single task, which is for some reason much heavier than the other ones, and it cannot complete. And if you look at the data, which is which the task is reading, it is very large. We are talking about gigabytes. We are talking about very large number of records. And if we compare it to the task which has completed, the other ones are much smaller. And on top of that, what we can see is that the task is spilling data to disks. It's spilling like big gigabytes into disk. So if some operation cannot be done in memory, Spark tries to dump it to disk in order to prevent out of memory. And in many scenarios, it's perfectly fine because it allows the job to complete. But if a single task is writing tens of gigabytes of data, it's a clear hint that we should think of a better parallelism. In my case, the job has no chance to complete. I'm using a small cluster with limited storage, and eventually it will fail with this quota. But this is a situation you would like to fix anyway, because we have this fancy distributed system. We have many machines. We have many, like lots of CPUs but we do the entire calculation on a single machine anyway. We have to wait for this single CPU, single task to, uh, to complete. So let's try to figure out a bit more. We go to the SQL tab, and that gives us some more statistics about what is happening, some more information about the, the 
um, the order of execution. So first of all, we are reading Parquet, nothing really fancy here. The first thing I recommend to pay attention to is this exchange box, which means pretty much shuffle. So we are shuffling the data over the network and it's important to pay attention to that box because that means we are using lots of IO. But on top of that, we are changing the data distribution. So if you hover over this, you can see that we are hash partitioning based on user ID. And that's not a surprise because we are using user ID in our query as partition column. And then if you read the stats here, you can see that the output partitions are not that large. The top one is 45 megabytes, which is perfectly fine. But if we look at the shuffle read, we can see that the top partition is almost 70 gigabytes. And that's definitely too much. That is suspicious. That is something we have to do something about. So in order to understand a bit more what is happening during the shuffling of the data, let's have a look at some pictures I have for you. In the window operation we used, Spark needs to regroup the data based on user ID. And this is just one example of operation requiring shuffling the data between executors. But basically, most of aggregations or joins will need to do a similar operation. So let's have a look at roughly what is happening during execution of our SQL code in the shuffle phase. First of all, what happens during the shuffle phase is each task does calculation which can be done locally. But at some point, we have to gather the same user together because we are partitioning by user ID in our SQL. So the task is preparing buckets with certain users and all user one records go to one bucket, all user two to another one and so on. And there will be multiple users in the same bucket, but one user has one and only one bucket assigned. And it's basically hashing operation. And all the other tasks are doing exactly the same. So when they are done, we have users grouped and stored into temporary files, and they are ready to be picked up. So for instance, user one will be processed by one task, but user two by another. And all the records of a respective user will be processed by a single task. And in most cases, it is perfectly fine. But the problem starts when users are not balanced. And some of them are producing much more records than the others. So in this case, the number of records of user one is significantly higher than the, the, than the other ones and the data is skewed. And if you think it is an artificial problem, it is not. These kind of situations happen very often. And one of the reasons for single user creating many more events than the others could be that the user is not a real user, but some bot, some automation made in the backend system so there was a hack in the backend system that introduced some automation reusing existing user abstraction. But in consequence, our data analy our analytics data is confusing. But we have to deal with it. We have to deal with problems like that. So what do we do? First, we should be able to understand what's going on and why the app is failing. And in our case, the app is failing because of single task is processing too much data. But you need to have a tool set to figure that out. Sometimes it is based on information from the Spark UI and it's obvious from there. Sometimes it is based on your knowledge of data distribution. And sometimes it is a mix. But as a rule of thumb, the more you know about your data, the easier it is to understand what's happening in your application during the runtime. And once we understand 
where the problem can, comes from. Once we understand that we have a skew which is not handled automatically, make sure that the data is correct. The skew might be a consequence of a bug. But then, if we confirm that the data is correct, the question is if we need all that data. Maybe this artificial user one is not necessary for our analysis. Maybe we can just filter out user one. But this presentation is about performance tuning. So let's try to come up with a fix. Let's try to fix the problem. So let's assume that we decided that we would like to have the logic like that on the entire data set. And coming up with a fix really depends on the actual data and logic. But let's have a look at what we can do with the code, with the problem I just presented. So the only reason Spark is pulling all the user one data to a single place is that it needs to know what the next timestamp is. And if you have the data together, sorted, it is a no-brainer to, to really calculate it. You just take the value from, from the next record and fill that in. Then in order to fill in the timestamp of the second record, you just repeat the procedure. And it's perfectly fine. The only problem is that user one has too many records to be processed in one executor, one JVM, one machine. But what if we do all that in smaller portions? Let's say we do that day by day or month by month. So if we change the definition of the window function to be partitioned by not only user, but also a day, we definitely have a better split of the records, but will it provide the same results? Oh, well, not exactly. We have the last record each day to fix because we don't have information about what happens the next day, but it is not a rocket science to fix that. So I will not be digging into every single detail of the code, but let's at least have a look at it. This is actually code someone else wrote, and it's simplified for this presentation, but the whole idea is that we define number of seconds we want to process in a single partition. And we have to do some timestamp calculation based on that number, and we use the column we just defined in our partition by. But end of the day, it's not a rocket science, and this code should work more efficiently, and we will check that soon. But I would like to mention that you probably noticed this code is more complex than the original one, and it is the price you pay for performance. So you always have to ask yourself if it's worth it. Often the performance tuning complicates the code, the ecosystem, testing, and so on, and you may you just need to make sure that it's worth it. So it's a question of if you spend a day to implement something that really unblocks you, or if you spend a day to gain just a one minute faster pipeline. Okay, so let's have a look at how the job performs when we run it. First of all, it completes within 11 minutes, which is great improvement. The previous one could not complete at all, and I, I just had to kill it after one hour or so. And then we can go to the SQL tab and see some statistics. So what was suspicious before was the size of the top partition after reading the shuffle data. And the size now is around two gigabytes, which is a great improvement. It is still not optimal, but it's apparently good enough. And then if we scroll down, we can see that the query plan is much more complex, but at the same time, it's not a surprise because the, the code we wrote is more complex. It can parallelize better, but it is more complex. 
And we are producing the results with Null, without Null, we union them together, and we are all good. So let's have a look at the stages and individual tasks to see what is going on there. And if we check one of them, we can see that the time spent by, by the, the individual tasks is much more even. So we don't have a single task which is doing all the heavy lifting. The, the load is distributed, which is great. And if we sort by task duration, we can see that the top task was running for three minutes, which is, which is great, actually. There is still room for improvements. We are spilling the data to disk. But keep in mind, this is an artificial data. The job parameters are not fully optimal. But the whole purpose of this exercise was to show you how to solve these kind of problems. But the real question would be, when do you optimize? Because you can optimize every Spark job. And the real question would be if it's worth it. You need to know what you are optimizing for. Because each optimization is a cost of your time you could spend on something else. And then if you have a job which is a blocker, which cannot complete, yeah, you just need to fix it. But if you are optimizing for, for time, if you're optimizing performance to, to make the job faster, then you need to understand why you are doing and what exactly you are optimizing for. Because maybe you have some SLA and you need to deliver the data by 7 o'clock, and that's why you're optimizing. Maybe you are optimizing because the feedback loop is just too slow and it's frustrating to wait for several hours to see the result of the change in the code. Or maybe the concern is the cloud cost and or the fact that you are blocking the other users of the cluster. So there are many reasons why you could optimize, but keep in mind the effort, the effort now, the effort you are spending on the changes now, but also the effort which will be in the future for maintaining the code which is, which is more complex. And when we are talking about the effort for the, for the maintenance, I was showing you the number of seconds, the number of seconds which we used in the in the window function and that has advantages first of all it, a, it is a very granular split other than that it probably would be more performant than uh, explicitly defining day and and an hour which we which we are splitting by but at the same time the code is complex and if i was writing that code from scratch i would probably decide to do explicit the day and an hour because the code would be more readable, easier to maintain. And if the performance is acceptable, I would always prefer the code which is more readable. So thanks a lot. I would really appreciate your feedback. I also wonder about what problems you are facing. Maybe I could help you and maybe we could record an episode about that. So don't be shy to reach out. Thanks again.